I'll, I'll have a few words to start with and introduce you. Okay. Now, um, Mike, I have this meeting is being recorded by the host or participant. Shall I click got it? Yes. Is that a yes? Yes. Your microphone's on the air. Oh. Okay. Are we ready? Can we get well, started? Just, just one minute. I just got okay. a I just got a box up from you guys saying that host disabled participant screen sharing, but I guess I'm just going to click okay because we appear to be good. You're fine, Mike said. Okay. Go ahead, Janet, if you want to say something, then I will move on. <laughs> okay, I, I'll, I'll cut the announcements a little short since we're getting started a little late. Um, okay. I do want to remind everyone that uh, from, from now on, our programs will all be in person. We won't be doing virtual anymore. Oh, applause, thank you. Uh, so yes, so we hope to see everybody in the room. Uh, we have some people here tonight, as well as Zoomers watching. Um, I just wanted to say quickly, we have some really great programs coming out in June. I don't want to elaborate right now, but they'll be in the newsletter and online in a few days. So uh, I want to get started with tonight's program. We have Bill Anderson with us. And uh, he is going to talk about the fascinating Von Trapp family. Uh, obviously, they were well-known worldwide singers with a very interesting history. And um, he's going to talk about th their career and also family that still lives uh, in Vermont. And most importantly for me, he's going to talk about the fact and fiction that's blended in the movie The Sound of Music. We want to know the truth, Bill. Okay, <laughs> take it away. Please welcome Bill Anderson. Thank you all. It's a beautiful May, Michigan evening, and I hope it is in Illinois as well. And I'd like to just mention that I have given this program about the Von Traps a number of times. Uh, mostly live before an audience, and sometimes with a few of the family there. And I once uh, greeted people and I asked one of the most silly p uh, questions. I said, is there anybody here tonight that has not seen The Sound of Music yet? Well, <laughs> of course, everybody has seen it. And people would chime in and say, I've seen it 12 times. I watch it every Christmas on ABC. I've seen it 50 times. I was in a stage production. I met Maria Von Trapp at her lodge. And some of the older people, this doesn't happen too much anymore, would say, I heard the Von Trapp family singers in 1946 or 1952, or I went to their music camp in Vermont. This family is certainly one of America's household names. And that happened first because of their fame as Austrian singers when they toured the world. And then of course it was enlarged a great deal by the movie broad, the movie version of The Sound of Music and the Broadway show, The Sound of Music, which in its first run on Broadway ran for several years, and it still is being played in all parts of the world today on stages. Well, this evening, I want to talk to you about the real Von Trapps. I can't tell you how fortunate that I feel that I got to know these wonderful people. And after the Trapps had arrived in America and made a name for themselves on the stage, they established a permanent home in Stowe, Vermont, because the mountains reminded them of Austria. That has morphed into the Trapp family lot. And when I was quite young, my parents saw to it that we had a vacation at the Trapp family lodge. So there I learned a lot about the real Von Trapps versus the movie or the stage Von Trapps. And this I will share with you. 
I'm starting out this evening to introduce you to the real family. First of all, you see there are more than seven children. Well, the reason for that is after the captain and Maria were married, they had three children, Rosemary, Lorley, and Johannes. About a year ago, we lost Rosemary at age 93. The year before, her sister, uh, Lorley, passed on at the age of 90. The other seven children uh, preceded the, the sisters. And now Johannes von Trapp is the only child of the captain and Maria of the 10 that toured the world and were a part of this wonderful family. Johannes was born in 1939, and he's still in Vermont at the Trapp Family Lodge, which he did a great deal to develop for his family. So I call this photograph safe in America because we are so conscious today in our daily news about immigrants, immigration, uh, negative feelings towards immigration, charity towards the immigrants that need it so badly. Back in 1938, the Von Trapp family were in that very same situation. They were seeking asylum in America. They were seeking a new life here as victims of the Nazi regime. So there is a great deal about their story that resonates today. I hope some of you saw Ken Burns' magnificent film last fall on the period of time when many, many Europeans were trying to enter the United States, 1939, 1940, 1938, 1936, as refugees. He told the story magnificently. And the Von Trapp family were a part of that. So to introduce you to the children, at the left in the blue dress is Agatha, the eldest sister. In the movie, she was portrayed as Liesel. Her brother Rupert, over at the far right, was actually the eldest child. And he would get so exasperated when people would say to him, Dr. Von Trapp, who are you in the movie? And he would affect a mock curtsy and he would say, I was Liesel. So there were changes in the children's name uh, and their uh, position in the family. But here you see the first, uh, the eldest, Rupert and Agatha. Next came Maria. There were two Marias in the family. And following her, Werner. And then came Hedwig, and then Johanna, and the youngest child of the seven, Martina. So those were the captain with seven children. And after the uh, marriage of Maria and the captain in 1927, their three children were born. Each one of these 10 children sang and performed with the Trapp family singers a world famous group that performed from the 1930s to the late 1950s. So there's your brief introduction and I will get into more of the stories as we go on. Well, in The Sound of Music, there are wonderful songs, wonderful music that we men can hum along with, we can sing the words. And uh, one of the songs begins with, let's start at the very beginning. So let me tell you about Captain Georg von Trapp and his first wife, Agatha Whitehead. We don't hear or learn very much at all that there was a first mother. But as you know, the captain was widowed, leaving him with seven children. Captain von Trapp was a Navy man in the Austrian Navy. And his father was in the same profession. It ran in the von Trapp family. Georg's father, uh, Captain, the first Captain von Trapp, uh, was a naval hero in the old Austria in the 1800s, but he died very young, leaving his young family um, orphaned, except for his wife, who raised them, of course. And Captain von Trapp carried on in the Austrian Navy, becoming very interested, particularly in submarine warfare. And that's where he made his name in World War I. 
Uh, Austria at that time had very different territories and boundaries. And what is now Croatia belonged to the old Austria. And Agatha Whitehead and her family lived there for a very good reason. Agatha's grandfather, and they were British people, they were from England, was the inventor of the torpedo. And when uh, Robert Whitehead invented that method of warfare, many, many uh, countries throughout the world signed up. They wanted access to uh, the torpedo, which could be used in submarine warfare. So a fact, a torpedo factory was located in Fiume, which as I said, is now Croatia. And the, the Whiteheads lived there in quite opulent splendor because creating war machinery is lucrative. The captain was stationed there and he went to a, a ball, a dancing party one evening for some of the naval cadets. And he looked across the room and saw this beautiful young woman playing violin. And he said to himself, this is who is going to be my wife. And so it happened. Uh, the family asked the captain to wait a while. Agatha was only 19 at that time. And he was somewhat older, but they married and started a blissful life together. And so came the seven children. The Whitehead family had a summer home in Zellemse, Austria, one of the most beautiful spots in Austria, if not world, in the world. And Agatha von Trapp said very rightfully, Austria is, a, is wonderfully beautiful. On one side of the lake was the Whitehead home, the summer home, and the other side was the little village. And to get across, it was easier for them to take a boat to town, to church, to do business, rather than take a horse and a carriage all the way around the lake and then approach the town this way. So during World War I, which broke out in 1914, of course, Captain von Trapp was on the side of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And he was a very, very well thought of naval captain. He was skilled, he was very humane, he had great empathy towards his crew. And the early submarines were hellacious because lack of oxygen and they would submerge. And then cautiously when it was at the last moment of endurance, the um, submarines would come up for air, hoping there wasn't a battleship around to attack them. So it was dangerous warfare, but the captain had a personality that inspired confidence and loyalty. While he was away at sea, his wife Agatha and the growing family lived at the White House, White, uh, the Whitehead home. And there were two children, three, four, five, and eventually seven. So the elder Von Trapp children grew up knowing this beautiful locale as their home. And they lived with their grandmother, their aunts, their mother, and whenever the captain could come home on leave. During World War I, the family was a separated family. Here's a photograph to the left showing Georg Von Trapp, his wife, Agatha, and one, two, three, five of the children. And this must have been on one of the captain's leaves from the Navy. They were separated from 1914 to 1918, except for those brief visits when the captain could come back home. But there was great security in the White House, White, I keep saying White House, Whitehead home. And here you see the loving mama, Agatha, with a batch of her children. There was great security, great happiness, and ex ecstasy when the captain, their father, came home. He was a wonderful father. And if there's anything that the Von Trapp children would like me to impart to you, is that 
their father was nothing like Christopher Plummer in The Sound of Music. You know, in that portrayal, the captain is very distant. He's very militaristic. He is rather cold, but the real Captain Von Trapp, quite the opposite. He was a loving father, nurturing, fun loving, and interested in each of his seven children and uh, taught them music, gave them instruments, uh, taught them to sail, taught them to swim. Uh, he was just a very hands-on dad. Captain Von Trapp became a national hero in Austria because of the sinking of the Leon Gambetta, a French cruiser, an enemy cruiser, and the captain submerged in his submarine, of course, torpedoed that, and this ship sunk within minutes. And the captain never, never seemed to reconcile the fact that he could not do more to save the crew. He was very grieved about that. He certainly would have done that as a humanitarian, but it was a major, major feat for the Austrian Navy. And as you've heard the expression, all is fair in love and war. And uh, although the captain uh, felt badly about it, he became a national heroine no, hero, excuse me, a national hero in Austria and was awarded the highest military award, the Maria Theresian Medal. And with that came the title Baron. Thereafter, Captain Von Trapp could rightfully be called Baron Von Trapp, but he was a very modest person and uh, did not take that affectation very seriously. When the war ended in 1918, Austria lost. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was defeated and by the Treaty of Versailles, Austria lost all of its sea coast. So there was the captain, a man without a ship and Austria without a Navy. What's going to happen next to him? The Navy was his life. So in post-war Austria, the captain of course returned home to his family, which now amounted to seven children. And he simply became a wonderful house husband, a stay-at-home dad, as we hear the saying these days, and nurtured and helped his children as they grew up. These qualities, of a loving father were very significant because Agatha Whitehead von Trapp, the mother of the seven children, the wife of Georg von Trapp, unfortunately died very, very young. And uh, she had contracted scarlet fever while nursing the children through a bout of scarlet fever, and she was not able to recover. So the Captain and the children were left very, very bereft because the mother and the wife were the sunshine of their home. But Captain Von Trapp did what he needed to do. He took over and filled the role as best he could with his children covering for both parents. They were living in Vienna at that time and these were hard times for Austria post-war. There was famine, uh, there was great, great uh, depression, uh, financial. Austria was struggling uh, as a post-war country that was in defeat. And Captain Von Trapp felt that it might be wise to move his family away from Vienna where there were reminders of his wife and the children's mother. And he asked them one day, how would you like to move to Salzburg? Well, for one reason, uh, Salzburg is close to Zellemsee, where the Von Trapp children had uh, cousins, aunts, uncles, and Captain Von Trapp knew people in Salzburg. And he decided with the assent of the children that they would move across Austria to this beautiful city. I hope some of you have been there 
I think it's just one of the most wonderful cities in Europe. For one thing, you can walk there and bicycle. It's uh, set, as you see, in the wonderful mountains. Here's the fortress atop one of them, looking down on Salzburg. Do you notice a lot of steeples and church spires and onion domes? Uh, Salzburg was given the nickname, the Rome of the North. It was a very ecclesiastical city, which will fit into our story in a little bit. So the Von Trapps moved to Austria. The captain bought a beautiful villa uh, several miles out of town in a suburban area. And this is the real Villa Trap. And it looks similar to the one we see in the, in the uh, film, The Sound of Music. And that's the Geisberg Mountain behind it. They were surrounded by mountains. There was a big park. And I mean, it was their park behind the villa. And it was on a quiet street with other similar aristocratic homes. And that was the Von Trapp home in near Salzburg. By this time, the children were in upper elementary grades in junior high, middle school or high school. And they either rode bicycle or walked into the center of Salzburg uh, to go to school. The captain once again was a stay at home dad. He managed his business, his family uh, fortune. He wrote his memoirs, he gave lectures, but his focal point was being a good father. His dream was to build a yacht and take his family around the world. And they were all trained as good sailors. So they had an idyllic life uh, near Salzburg in those early uh, 1930s and late 1920s. Another change in the family. The captain's second daughter, Maria, was rather frail from an illness, a childhood illness. And walking into Salzburg to school, it was about 45 minutes, exhausted her. So the captain felt, let's have a tutor come into our villa and teach little Maria her lessons until she regains her strength. So the captain then needed to go in search of a tutor. And this was common in those days. You had a lot of live-in help. Uh, a tutor would live in the family and teach the little children or whoever needed it. And the big villa trap could accommodate such a crowd of people. The captain went to the Nonberg Abbey. And you've seen this in The Sound of Music. And I think everyone knows who was attempting to be a good nun in the Nunberg Abbey. She was a young woman by the name of Maria Kuchera from Vienna. And this is the famous Maria of the song, How Do You Solve a Problem Like Maria? And Maria, of course, became the second wife of Captain von Trapp and the second mother of the seven children. Maria summed it up. I was very unnun like And she did do uh, things like whistle down the staircase, slide down stairway banisters, sing and run. And she was, as she said, a tomboy of the worst. And as she said, the captain inquired about somebody that could live in and tutor. And Maria said, I think the nuns must have prayed all the time that I would go. And the idea was that Maria Kucheru would spend maybe a year in the Von Trapp home or however much it took to help young Maria uh, recover fully so she could return to school. And during that process, when Maria was in the Von Trapp household, I think you know what happened. She became very attached to the seven children who were of course lonely without a mother figure. She was fun like an older sister. She liked to climb mountains. 
She liked to play volleyball. She liked to And the Von Trapp children were born in a very aristocratic milieu. And they uh, were quiet and they were cultured. But the thing that young Rhea and the seven children found greatly in common was their love of music and their love of singing together. That's all uh, portrayed in the movie, The Sound of Music. But the music they sang was quite a bit different. Maria, coming from the non Abbey, knew uh, religious music, Latin hymns, Gregorian chant. And the Von Trapps were Catholic, as you probably can remember. So they sang sacred music together. But Maria also taught them folk songs and madrigals and folk dancing. And Captain Von Trapp heard the sound of music throughout his house every day. He wrote a letter to one of his relatives that had gone to America that my children sing all day long. And they sounded amazingly well. So this was the beginning of the next chapter of their story. Captain and Maria were married in 1927. Here you see the wedding party. Uh, here are the seven children and a couple of their cousins, the captain and Maria, and some other friends or relatives that attended their wedding. So Maria, as a very, very young woman, 22, became the Baroness von Trapp. She said later on, at 22, you don't think a thing about taking on seven children, but today I wouldn't even go near that challenge. And as Maria explained the dynamics of her marriage and her close rapport with the children, she said, I fell in love with the children, married their father, I got used to the father, and we were very happy. You should know that the captain was 25 years older than Maria. He was 47. And it didn't seem to make a difference. And his fatherly uh, role even increased as the years went by. Here are the seven Von Trapp children, probably about the time of their father's second marriage. And I'll just run through the names again. Little Martina at the left, Johanna, Hedwig, Werner, Maria, Agatha, and Rupert. And this is at the time that the children were learning to play instruments, learning to sing as a group, and having a wonderful, wonderful rapport that began with their second mother. As the 1930s went by, I mentioned to you that the captain and Maria had two girls, Rosemarie and Lorley, and the singing continued, but it wasn't anything public. They sang around the fire in the evenings. They sang on hikes. Uh, it was simply a hobby that they loved very, very much. Next to Austria, across the German border, there were rumblings of Nazism. Georg von Trapp was a staunch patriot. He was an Austrian patriot. He said that my allegiance is to our emperor. He was concerned by some of the alarming tales of the Nazis and some of the ideas that Adolf Hitler espoused and spoke of on the radio. As long as they could, the Von Trapps continued their life as well as other Austrians as it had always been. But it became inevitable that Hitler had his eye on annexing Austria. In, 19, in the um, early 30s, the worldwide depression of course hit. Austria was not immune. And through a series of circumstances, Captain Von Trapp lost most of their fortune. And this was a new era to this wealthy aristocratic family. But the seven children, the elder children, were such good sports that they said, 
will get a chance now to keep house and cook and learn how to do things around the house. And the captain was very, very concerned because he had all these children and he felt somewhat responsible for the loss of their money. And Maria had a brilliant idea. The house was so large that she said, why don't we rent out rooms? And that's exactly what happened. Uh, college professors, students took rooms in the Von Trapp house. So they were able to keep going, keep the household going. And at the same time, the children were developing as singers. Fortunately, Rupert turned into a bass and the brother Werner turned into a tenor. And they had exactly the mixture of voices among the girls that created a mixed choir. Uh, two sopranos, two altos, et cetera. So without knowing it, they were reaching a professional status simply because of their singing around home. They also were fascinated with early instruments. There was a movement at that time in Austria called early music. And that meant Baroque music. And from the 13th, 14th, 15th century, and J American jazz was coming to Europe and the Von Trapps did not particularly like it at all. They appreciated these um, wonderful pieces by Mozart, Haydn, Brahms, etc. And to um, function with that type of vocal music, they learned early instruments like recorders and spinet and so on. So they were instrumentalists as well as being singers. Because of the loss of money during the depression, Maria had another idea. The Salzburg Festival was just a few miles from their home. And this is the annual famous, famous Salzburg Festival that brought people in from all over the world and opera stars and um, wonderful conductors from all over the world. And there was a singing contest, which you may remember from The Sound of Music, which has some reality. And a famous opera singer heard the Von Trapps sing in the garden behind their house. And she stopped to see them about renting the house during the festival. And she said, children, you have gold in your voices. You've got to sing at the Salzburg Festival. You've got to go to America. They'll love you there. So the captain was not very much enthused about his family standing on a stage and singing in public, no less. Because as you remember, he was a baron. He was a war hero. And that just was not done in aristocratic houses. He was the leader of the family, the supporter of the family. Uh, this opera star, Lottie Lehman, encouraged them to do this. So he said, you may sing there once. Well, they did take a prize for singing. And at the Salzburg Festival, there were concert managers from around the world that came to check out the entertainment. And they immediately approached the Von Trapps about going on tour. So in 1935-36, the Trapp Family Choir made their first tour of Europe, and they were a sensation. They sang at the World's Fair in Paris. They sang before 3,000 people in Berlin, and they went to Holland, Belgium, France, uh, the Scandinavian countries, and they were a musical sensation on the radio in concerts. So a new career was starting for this family. And while Hitler and the Nazis were planning and carrying out many, many evil things, the Von Trapps were singing of peace and joy and godly notions and beautiful uh, Germanic songs, Austrian folk songs, Italian madrigals and so on. And they returned from this concert tour. And a few months later, in March 38, the Nazis invaded Austria. So Austria essentially was annexed to Germany. Captain von Trapp was distraught. 
And this was a bloodless coup because the chancellor of Austria encouraged the uh, Austrians, don't take up arms. We're being invaded by a strong, strong military, and I don't want Austria to become a bloodbath. Well, you probably remember the story of Captain Von Ter Trapp refusing to hang the Nazi flag in front of his house because Hitler was immediately going to travel to Austria, make public appearances, give speeches. One of his early stops was Salzburg. So the Nazis that were there, and many Austrians were Nazi sympathizers, uh, they noticed that the von Trapp home did not have a swastika. And finally, just to appease the Nazis, they put a tiny little Aust uh, uh, swastika flag on their house so it would not arouse undue suspicion. Well, things went very fast during the invasion. Because of the von Trapp's high profile concert tour, the Nazis were very, very interested in gaining their seeming approval. So for Hitler's birthday in April 1938, they were approached and asked to sing birthday greetings to the Fuhrer over the radio. And they simply said, no, we're not interested. Rupert, the eldest son, just graduated from medical school. And he was offered a very, very important position in one of the uh, hospitals in Vienna. The reason being, there was a great need of doctors because the Nazis had removed the Jewish physicians. Rupert was very new in the medical world and he said, I simply cannot serve them, nor am I prepared to be the head of a hospital. So he declined. Finally, Captain von Trapp, who was well remembered by Germany, as a Navy man and a World War I hero, was asked to take over as a very, very important high up naval advisor and captain. And the captain who was in his late 50s by that time simply refused. And as Maria von Trapp said, you just can't say no to the Nazis three times. It was getting very dangerous. The Von Trapps had retained their butler and a few of the household helpers because the house was, was very, very good sized. And they had now boarders that needed to be there. And their butler was loyal to them, but he had secretly become a member of the Nazi party. And he said to the captain, you need to leave. You need to leave Austria because your name is on a list as a person that's not in favor of the party. Such people were political prisoners and it would have been likely that they would have, the family would have been sent to Dachau concentration camp. Well, the singing helped get them from Austria and they received an invitation to do a concert tour in America in the fall of 1938. So they had a way to get out of Austria and support in America by earning money from concerts and a reason to exercise their Italian passports and leave Austria. So this was the escape. This is how it happened. And by the way, I wrote a children's book called V is for Von Trapp. And here is one of the, the spreads from that book. And it shows exactly what happened. The Von Trapps packed knapsacks, very limited luggage. They didn't want to look obvious. And they went to the local railroad station, very close to their house. And they told friends and neighbors were going on a summer vacation, mountain climbing in Italy. And to a few close members of the family, they said, then we're going to New York for a concert tour. So they did not go singing over the mountains which would not be a good thing to do to attract attention. 
They simply acted as if they were going on a summer vacation and they never came back until years later. So that's the story of their famous escape, which has been called several times one of the most famous escape stories in history. Arriving in New York City, the family had $4 left. And you remember they were a family of, well, I was going to say 10, nine and a half children because Maria was expecting. And the Von Trapp family's success as singers was very, very um, uh, 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 indebted to Dr. Franz Bosner, an Austrian priest. And he was a wonderful musician, conductor, arranger, collector of old music that they sang. And Father Wasner was with them as well. Of course, he had to go as their conductor. So it was a family of 13 that disembarked in New York City. And as I say, $4 left, a typical American immigration story. So the Von Trapps went on their first tour of America, were amazed by America. And Maria, the, the daughter, said to me one time, Bill, we didn't know a thing about America, except that there were cowboys, skyscrapers, and gangsters. So they started singing. The audience loved them greatly. They were so sincere on the stage. They portrayed this wonderful family singing together, and they were very, very talented singers, group singers. Here they are as they are disembarking from uh, the ship in America, New York City. And a few of the children could speak English. Captain Von Trapp could speak some English because you have to remember the Whitehead influence, the first mother, her family were, were Brits. So Maria mentioned when they came into America that their goal was to come to bring the ancient culture to this beautiful country. And that they did because they were an amazing cultural exchange for America and continue to be to this very day. The first tour of the Trap Family Singers took them to 20 different states and Maria was very brave because she was accept, expecting Johannes, the 10th child. And in those days, uh, women that were expecting mostly stayed home, mostly stayed rather quiet. They certainly weren't going on stage and they weren't entertaining and doing public things. So before Maria left Austria, she had a series of costumes created whereby as she grew more and more pregnant, she changed into a larger costume or outfit that had more girth above her waistline than below. And at first the concert reviewers mentioned that Baroness von Trapp is a stately woman. And then she became a portly woman and then she became a majestic woman. And when the first concert tour ended, the Von Trapps found lodging in Philadelphia, a house that was loaned to them by Americans. And Johannes was born in, in January, 1939. So she sang right up to Christmas time uh, with this deep, dark secret. And when their concert manager learned that she had done this, he was horrified and canceled many of their upcoming concerts, which was difficult because money was very, very tight with them. A huge group like this and uh, the traveling that they had to do and hotels and restaurants and so on, because they weren't allowed to bring money really from Europe. One of the things that the Von Trapp family really appreciated about America is its generosity. Maria said, refugees have lost their country and everything else. Our new American friends made us feel secure. And they made many, many friends on that first tour in America. 
who became lifelong friends and supporters of them. Life on the road was rigorous. Uh, they traveled by bus. Trap family singers became a, a common insignia in New York City and other major cities where they gave concerts. And they would have to travel for hours each day to get to the next town, set up for the concert, give the concert, go to a reception, go back to the hotel, and simply start over again the next day. So life on the road was rigorous. They had more than just a living in mind. That was necessity. And staying together was necessity. That was the only way they could earn a living as trap family singers. And the youngest daughter of the family, Lorley, said many, many times, we knew that God had a purpose in our singing. And they sang you know, in praise of God and beautiful um, old church music, um, particularly the Gregorian chant and Latin masses and so on. So they sang for God in two different ways because they made such a profound impression on people and the idea of a family this tightly knit and staying together and singing together. That was part of their mystique that they gained here in America. Eventually, the concerts became much, much popularity. And they were singing in the biggest concert halls in America. And this is interesting. Look at all the overflow audience on the stage. There are hardly room for trap family singers there. And America loved them and embraced them. And they toured for 22 years. Uh, every year, three months, six months. One year they gave 200 concerts. They were a very, very famous concert group. Well, after a few years, the Von Trapps had paid their debts back, supported themselves, and instead of living in hotels and borrowed houses, they decided it was time for them to put down roots in America. The question was, where? They had given a few concerts in the state of Vermont, and every time they crossed a state line, their bus driver would toot the horn a couple times and announce, you have now crossed the line into, well, in this case, Vermont. But he said to the Von Trapps, don't bother to look out the window here. This is a very unprogressive state. All they raise here are tombstones and maple syrup. Well, the traps didn't agree because as they went further north into Vermont, you can imagine what they were reminded of. Their old countryside, their old homeland in Austria, because the Green Mountains were very, very similar to the mountains of their region of Austria. And they thought this would be a good place for us to start our permanent home. So one summer uh, on hiatus from concerts, they came to Stowe, Vermont, and they rented what was called a tourist home back in those days. I don't think they exist anymore, but it perfectly fitted their big family. And they hiked and they had a great time that summer and they hated to leave at the end of the vacation. And the idea went through the family, why don't we buy a farm? Why don't we buy a piece of land here in Stowe? And that they did. They discovered this beautiful, beautiful expanse of the Green Mountains. And on it was a very rundown house, old barns, rundown machinery. But the family thought, aha, between concerts, we'll run a farm. They liked agriculture, they liked the out of doors, and this became their American home. The house was totally, totally ill suited for them because it was small. It was an 1840s um, Greek revival farmhouse that you see here in very, very poor shape. The captain looked at the barns and the buildings and he said, that house looks like it doesn't know which side to fall down on. But Maria said, we can always build a new house, but we can't build a view. 
So it was on that premise that they bought the farm in Vermont and that still is their family home. Now the Trapp Family Lodge so that hundreds of other families can enjoy it year after year. So this is the beginning of the Von Trapps of, Aust of um, Vermont. World War II by this time had escalated. War had been declared. The Americans were deeply involved in World War II and the concerts were going very, very well. But Rupert and Werner, the older boys, wanted to do their share in defeating Hitler. So they joined the American army and they trained with the ski troops, being Austrians and from the Alps, they were good skiers. And the ski troops of the um, army went through rigorous training in Colorado. And the idea was as World War II waned and the Italians, the Germans were expected to lose that the um, uh, ski troops would come up north through Italy and squeeze the Nazi center of Germany and help bring an end to the war. And that's exactly what happened with Rupert and Werner's war service. They had amazing stories of that. Well, how would the family continue to earn money with the two boys gone? Well, it was wartime and American families just did what needed to be done. So the American audiences fully accepted a singing group without the two male voices. So now the seven Von Trapp sisters and their mother were the war version of the Trapp family singers. And in the summer times, they went back to Vermont and literally bit by bit built the beautiful new home on their farm. It was modeled after an Austrian chalet and the girls actually helped with construction. This being wartime, materials were scarce and uh, laborers of course were scarce because they were fighting the war. But this family was so energetic and so creative and so united that they got it all done. And here you see the war edition, the all female choir that continued to tour and gain more fame all the time. And here are the two brothers who were fighting in Europe against Hitler. Uh, your Illinois people, they were very, very popular at Orchestra Hall of Chicago and returned there every year for Christmas concerts and concerts at other seasons on their tour. As if all this work, singing, touring, building a new farm, building a new house wasn't enough, the family had an idea. Vermont, they said, was so beautiful that they couldn't not share it with the American public. So in 1944, they started the Trap Family Music Camp. This was a summer camp dedicated to teaching group singing, teaching instruments, learning folk dances. And the girls and Maria and the captain worked very, very hard to get this camp going. And the first season was such an, a success that it went on for 12 more years. Here you can see their conductor, Father Wasner, leading a much larger group. And I'll just mention to you, it looks quite female. And that's because most of the men were away at war. And then after the war, there were more mixed groups with um, male singers and, and of course the female singers. Uh, the Von Trapp family hospitality at the camp was very, very congenial, very gemutlichkeit. The, Food was wonderful, the mountain vistas were wonderful, and people came back year after year after year. And that eventually uh, morphed into the Von Trapp's big home becoming the Trapp Family Lodge. After World War II, Werner returned to the family singing group. Rupert, who had put off his medical career, took some refresher courses at the University of Vermont and became a 
very well loved doctor in Rhode Island. And he had to leave the singing group, which was very difficult for his family. And Maria, who was quite a forceful mother and second mother, was very, very put out that Rupert could think of leaving the group. But it was beginning to become time for the children to start thinking about what are we going to do with our individual lives and dreams. In 1947, on their tour of the West Coast, the captain was not well. Oftentimes he rested in the back of the bus on a little cot there and he developed a very hacking cough. What had transpired was the terrible conditions of his submarine included almost asphyxiation if the sub remained submerged too long. And the crew, as well as the captain, were inhaling exhaust fumes and many of those submarine crew members had lung problems, lung cancer, and died in later years. And this was what was happening to Captain Von Trapp. Here's the last family picture in their completed home in Stowe, Vermont. The captain is not looking as healthy or chipper as he had. And I don't know when this picture was taken, but I would get the same impression from him. So here are the 10 children, their father, their mother and second mother. And after the completion of the 1947 tour, the family came home and Georg von Trapp died, May 1947. This was a big blow to the family because he helped keep the equilibrium. If anyone got touchy, he had a way of diffusing that. It was not easy to travel and live together in such a large family group all the time. The captain seemed to be the mediator of all problems and the one that could smooth things out. The family was devastated, of course, and as in the old Austrian tradition, they buried him very close to their home. They started their own consecrated cemetery and this is the grave of the captain and now Maria. And there's a small cemetery encircled with fences and beautiful flowers very near the Trapp family lodge, their former home. And it's there today and, and quite a few of the members of the family are buried there now. The Trav family lodge just kept growing and growing and growing because people loved to stay there. And it was both a family home and a family business. And there was wonderful cuisine, food there. It was comfortable. It was in the beautiful green mountains. And all of this still stands today. The family kept singing for another eight years after the captain's death. And they traveled to 40 different uh, 40 different countries all together in their career. They made tours across America every year. They were especially beloved and renowned for their Christmas concerts as they traveled from city to city to city in December. Some of the children were married during this era, late 40s, early 50s. And Maria could see that this perhaps would be the end of the Trapp family singers. You can't take, uh, say, uh, Werner married Erica. You can't take Erica and their children on the bus on a concert tour. Just wouldn't work. So after a farewell tour that took them almost a year to the South Seas, to New Zealand, to Australia, and a farewell tour of America, the Trapp family singers made their last bows in 1956 and finished up their very, very distinguished career. Maria explained it. She said the perfect ending of a family choir is when grandchildren arrive. And there are now 27 grandchildren and multitudinous great grandchildren and great great grandchildren from this family. Maria and several of her children became missionaries in New Guinea for a while after the singing years. And during that time, Maria sold the rights to her book, The Story of the Trap Family Singers. 
And she sold it to a German film in the 1950s. And they made a movie called The Trap Family. It was very, very successful in Europe. And then it was shown around the world with subtitles and Japanese and Italian and, and any other language. It was very, very popular based on this book. Maria made a slight error that turned into a big error. She sold the rights for her book for $9,000 flat, no royalties to this German firm. Well, when this movie began touring in America, it stimulated the imaginations of a famous Broadway musical star, Mary Martin, and Rodgers and Hammerstein. And Mary Martin said, I think that role was made for me. I want to play Maria. So this is how the Sound of Music Broadway play evolved. And it opened on Broadway in November of 59. And as I say, it's still touring the world today. Right now, there's a major tour of India. So this, this uh, Broadway play and The Sound of Music, which has been seen by 1 billion people, a certain estimate says, has made this family world renowned. Several years after the Broadway success came The Sound of Music in 1965. It won five Academy Awards. Here's the famous Julie Andrews opener. And I don't know how it's been calculated, but the Rogers and Hammerstein uh, organization has done a lot of the data analysis, which says that uh, 1 billion people have seen this movie. This movie catapulted Maria von Trapp into the role of a famous celebrity. She loved it. She lectured, she made appearances, she traveled across the United States uh, telling her story to large crowds. And back home at the Trapp Family Lodge, she was the genial hostess for the place because her children had all moved away pretty much. And she was the last von Trapp at the lodge. And every evening she would go through the dining room and greet people. Uh, she would pose for pictures, sign books, chat with the guests. And it was a real thrill uh, to meet the real Maria from the, from the Sound of Music when you would go to the Trap Family Lodge. My family had that experience of getting to know her. And then I had the experience to know eight of the children and Maria and interview them for magazines and finally write several books about this family. So in case you're wondering how I know so much about them, I had the rare, rare treat to be befriended by the Von Trapps. In their family, there are two kinds of traps, the Von Trapps and the non-traps. And if you're a non-trap, that means they have taken you into their family. They're that sort of people. Maria lived until 1987. And before her death, she made a comment that my life is like a story, a very beautiful story. Today, the Trapp Family Lodge is 2,000 acres of beautiful Vermont. Johannes von Trapp, the youngest child, is still there. He served as manager for decades and brought cross-country skiing to their land. He, in recent years, has created a brewery with wonderful Austrian beer, authentic beer. The lodge uh, has been enlarged greatly and it's simply filled most of the year. Skiers in the winter, uh, vacationers in the summer, and the highlight of the beauty of Vermont comes during leaf season in October. So this started with the little farmhouse I showed you and it's something very, very special today. Fine dining, Austrian and American cuisine. As I mentioned, Johannes uh, pioneered cross country skiing on their place. There were old logging roads behind their property making great places for trails. 
And it is called the most used and the best cross country ski resort in America and one of the first. Johannes' son, Sam, is now in the business as well as his sister, Christine, and they're all athletes. And as soon as the snow falls, they're on their cross country skis, encouraging guests to do the same. Von Trapp Brewery, another new innovation, newer innovation of Johannes Von Trapp's. And there's endless things to do on their property, hike and swim and ponds and bicycle and on and on and on. The slogan there is a little of Austria, a lot of Vermont. And another slogan is you can simply exercise your right to relax looking at mountain seas scenes like this and the hills are still alive and i just feel so fortunate to be able to share this story with you and here's the kids book i wrote and here is the world of the von trapp family book that i wrote with a lot of input from the von traps themselves so the story of the von trapp family fact and fiction Broadway stage, world famous movie. And as I said at the beginning, there's certainly a household word uh, throughout our world today. So does anyone have any questions? Janet, do we have an option for questions? Uh, yes, uh, we do. Anyone have any questions here in the room? Oh, yes, we have a question. I read books about them and I thought that initially they were not successful in the United States. The first tour was rough and I'll tell you why. They were very uh, much attuned to music lovers in Europe, very formal. People wear evening gowns and tuxedos to a concert and the Europeans really preferred the highbrow music of the great composers. The Von Trapps sang that caliber of music. So at first it was rather difficult for America to get used to their artistry. And I have just thought personally, another thing, they sang a great deal of German composers in German. And think about 1938 and 1939. I'm sure that made uh, a concern for their managers in America and their audiences weren't too keen on these people. As a matter of fact, the Von Trapps were suspected of being perhaps for Hitler. And after they had lightened up their repertoire and included American folk songs, and Maria became adept at English so she could be the entertaining hostess on the stage and talk more and have a rapport. Then the success came. But the first concerts were difficult and with good advice and total cooperation, they became beloved on the stage. As people would say, we feel as if we're a guest in your home for a musical evening. So you're right about that at first. Nobody seemed to want to listen to Bach for 45 minutes. And they got over that quickly and became more attuned to the general public in America. Thanks for that question. Do we have any other questions? I have a question. Yes. Sylvia, you have a question? Thank, thank you. Was there a big difference between the German movie and the American movie? The German movie, I've seen it once. And by the way, it was so successful, they made a sequel to it called The Trap Family in America. Uh, it stuck very close to Maria's book. 
And that was something about the sound of music that disturbed her, this stern portrayal of her husband. And when the sound of music was going to be made into the film, she made a phone call to the producer or some high mucky muck and said, I understand you're going to make my story into a movie. I'd like to tell you about my husband. And I really wish that you would portray him as the loving husband and father. And whoever she reached in Hollywood said, sorry, we're not interested in the truth. And thank you very much. And he hung up on her. And if there was anything that the Von Trapp children really um, grieved as far as this movie version was the portrayal of their father. And every one of them, when they were here, when they gave lectures, when they wrote, they tried to remind the American public that this man was such a humane and affectionate dad. Was there a reason why they portrayed Von Trapp in, in well, that way? All I can think of is every story has to have a conflict or an antagonist. But, you know, he did thaw out later in, in the play, in the movie. But the marching stuff, absolutely not. But the whistle, yes. And young Maria, his daughter, she had a bosun's whistle that she kept in her house. And she would pull it out and demonstrate for us. And there was a reason for that whistle. Their estate in Salzburg was so big and the house was so large that if he wanted to summon her or her, one of her brothers or the second mother, each one of them had a code whistle and he would blow that whistle and they'd go to with their father's office or, or library to see what he wanted. And then he had a code for everybody to come running. So that was a way of communication, the whistle, but it wasn't anything militaristic and he didn't want them to march. They wore sailor suits because they loved their father so much and they enjoyed wearing the sailor suits that he would have been accustomed to. Anything else you'd like to mention? Well, if there are no other questions, uh, we'll say good night to you and thank you very much, Bill. Very, well, so much information and it was all great. Well, thanks, Janet. There's only one thing I wish everybody. I would like to be there in person and be with you. And I love the live appearances, but during COVID and now after sometimes, this is the second best thing. So I've enjoyed revisiting the Von Trapps Go to Stowe, Vermont, to their lodge if you ever can. Go to Salzburg and go on the Sound of Music tour. And there are a lot of books of Maria's to read, uh, my books, maybe in your library. And it's a wonderful story to remember. Thank you so much. Thank you.